This is Colin Crawford, and you're listening to Pro Lacrosse Talk. On Shriver. Snyder with scores! Now it's Brett yeah. Pinnell scores! Hands off for Ravel, switches hands and scores! Kyle Elmiller showing off those shifty skills. Right off the bat, there's Lyle Thompson! Crawford slings one home! Callum Crawford is having himself an unreal night. Welcome to season two of the Pro Lacrosse Talk podcast, the voice of Pro Lacrosse. I'm Hutton, he's Adam, and together we're bringing you interviews from all your favorite players and coaches, as well as news and analysis from all four professional lacrosse leagues. I'm Hutton Jackson, the host of the Pro Lacrosse Talk podcast, and today I'm joined by the NLL's leading scorer, MVP finalist, and one of the newest members of the New York Riptide, Calum Crawford. Calum, welcome to the show. How's it going today? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, excited to get this going. Absolutely. No, uh, we want to kind of talk about, you know, this big offseason move, you making the jump to play for the Riptide. But before we do that, I kind of want to go back to uh, when you first started playing the game. You, you were a native, you're a native of Ottawa. Um, so tell me a little bit when you first picked up a stick and kind of who got you interested in the sport of lacrosse? Uh, I think I was around like 10 years old. Kids in my neighborhood, uh, a couple older kids were playing lacrosse. I wanted to fit in. I, I never really played organized sports. Uh, mm-hmm. When I was younger, my family always traveled. We have a, a beautiful cottage in, in Quebec, uh, about two hours away from Ottawa and lived there for the summer. So I never played any real sports. I didn't get into hockey. Uh, parents never pushed it. Probably a good thing. Hockey is so cre- incredibly expensive. But uh, I just wanted to fit in with some kids in my neighborhood. So uh, they were playing lacrosse. I asked if I could... Uh, if I could play, my parents supported it and kind of took it off from there. No, that's great. And then, you know, you didn't really have much uh, junior A experience before you were drafted 18th overall by the Calgary Roughnecks in 2005. So talk to me a lot about how you kind of developed as a lacrosse player and then making the jump to the pros. Was it kind of a difficult transition? Uh, Yeah. So Ottawa didn't have junior A lacrosse. It still doesn't. Uh, Our pinnacle in just the far East region was junior B. It's what you had. Um, And, uh, you just didn't know about the gap between junior B and junior A because you weren't really exposed to it. I got called up once my brother was drafted junior A, uh, moved out for his, his rookie year and, and did that thing. And I think he got traded to Brampton at one point. I went up uh, in my second year of junior and played one game for Brampton. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was all that I knew of, of junior A at the time. Um, my, my, I think my third and fourth year junior B, I had really good statistical years, uh, which was great. And there used to be this online forum that everybody would go on. It was like, you know, the days in the internet where everybody could hide behind whatever. And they would talk about lacrosse, this OLA fan forum and any old people my age and stuff will know exactly what this thing is. Uh, and my, my dad was obsessed with it for some reason. He would never write on it, but he would always read it for some reason. And we were in a junior B playoff thing against one team I can't remember who and uh there was a thing on this forum that my dad read to me and it was you know saying hey all you got to do to beat Nepean is stop the guy with the orange stick and I had this all orange stick for some reason no <laughs> idea why and uh the comments under it started to say like who I was and uh it basically was people saying you know it was compliments saying he was good which was great but it, it started to turning into yeah but he couldn't do any of that in junior A and that resonated with me in the sense of like this is true I can't think I'm this good if I'm not even playing it at the highest level uh because I you know I much like most young kids if you're having a lot of success it can get to you and and you think you Mm. you start you know reading your own whatever and uh it humbled me a little bit and put me back into the right mind space because I was like these guys have a point I wasn't offended I didn't sit back and, and and you'd be like oh this is bullshit but it was uh it's true. You know, I'm having a lot of success at the bottom tier for the most part at the time of lacrosse. So it motivated me uh, to want to have the opportunity to do, see what I could do at junior A and see if I could even hang. Uh, and luckily Ottawa got a junior A team that following year called the Ottawa Titans. I think they lasted for all two, maybe three years. Mm-hmm. Started out with them, uh, which was great. I think I missed the first two games because I was actually at Dowling College. Uh, so mm-hmm. I missed the first two games. Uh, statistically I was doing great for them. I think I was their, their leading score by like 30 points. Now I was, there were some really good players on that. Like how Cannon was on that team, but he was super young. I think he would have been a rookie in that. Um, but the way that we did it, we had this coach named Peter Vipon and he was so old school that he didn't believe in offense and defense. Everybody had to play both ways. So we had lines and we had four lines and, uh, I was on the fourth line 
he absolutely hated me. And I'm sure I did something for him to, you know, dislike me. I don't know what I did, but I'm sure I did something. Uh, but I was on the fourth line, not playing power play, anything. And I was leading the team by 30 points. Um, so for me, I was obviously getting disgruntled and, and mm -hmm. angry and whatnot. But uh, luckily the trade deadline was coming and I was getting some interest from a couple of different junior A teams to, to pick me up for a playoff run. And uh, I was so incredibly honored and grateful that uh, the Six Nations Arrows were interested in picking me up. Uh, they were able to make a trade. I don't think uh, the coach was too concerned about letting me go because, I don't. again, I don't think he was too much of a fan of mine. Uh, but he, uh, they traded me out to Six Nations and I got to actually see what real lacrosse was for the first time in my life, which was amazing. Randy Chrysler was the, the head coach of the Arrows. Uh, learned a ton from him for the, you know, end of a season and mental run that we had that team was so incredibly gifted it was Cody Jamison when he was young and you could mm -hmm. see how great Cody was even then yeah. um you know Sid Smith you could see the leadership in I'm older than all these guys and I went in there as a rookie basically not really playing junior a and uh being probably the oldest guy or one of the oldest guys on the team and you know falling in suit being led by a guy like Sid Smith who I think was at least two years younger than me uh, and there were some other great players on that team. So I got to be exposed to junior A and everything. And that's the only reason I got drafted was I was able to be put on place to be exposed. I, I was able to be somewhere that somebody could at least see me play. Because me doing it at junior B, there are players who get drafted at a junior B, but there's always a question mark and is it worth it? I at least got to display what I could do at the highest level, which was great that it made at least one team, uh, the Calgary Roughnecks, which I – I think I only heard from two teams going into the draft and nor did I even think I was going to get drafted uh, until it actually happened. But Calgary was one of the two teams that contacted me, said they were interested in potentially taking me in there with their first pick in the draft, which happened to be in the second round. And, uh, you know, it came to fruition and here we are today. Yeah, no, and I think it's interesting too. You, you said that you got to kind of learn how lacrosse is played when you were playing for Six Nations. I remember we did an interview with Brent Adams who said he talked to you and you kind of talked to him about how he could get involved in the box game and told him to, you know, go play on a reservation and kind of see what the box game is all about. And that kind of prompted him to do that. Um, then, you know, when you made the jump to your career, you played a little bit with the Roughnecks. You had some stops with the San Jose Stealth, Chicago Shamrocks, Edmonton Rush before kind of settling in with the Minnesota Swarm where you had 96 points in your first season there in 2010. Uh, what about playing for the Swarm kind of allowed you to kind of grow as a player and kind of find your, your element? Uh, so I think again, the turnover, which was interesting, a lot of people talk about it because I am the definition of a suitcase in, in <laughs> game. um, and you know, we had expansion and dispersal almost every year in the NLL, my first mm -hmm. few years. And I was, I was, I wasn't good enough to be protected, but I was good enough to be the guy who was always picked up right away. Yep. Uh, yep. so, you know, for me, it's, you're not wanted, but at the same time, you're like, there's something there, which was great. Um, so I was traded once so I got traded out of San Jose, but that was because I wanted to go back and finish my education. Uh, so I asked, you know, can I get back east? I'm, I can't live in San Jose. That commute from Ottawa to San Jose does not make any sense for anybody. And I wasn't good enough to spend that type of money to fly somebody that far. Mm -hmm. uh, so they sent me to Chicago. They, you know, they went uh, belly up, mm -hmm. got picked up by Edmonton and, and so on. Uh, but those, those four years were great because I had to play a different role everywhere I went. And I got to be around some incredible lacrosse players um, who were, some were incredibly helpful, took me under their wing, like Tracy Koloski, others that I had to just, you know, sit back and watch and, and try to pick up what I could. Guys like Colin Doyle, um, you know, wasn't so much a person who wanted to work with me and help me, but he's so freaking good and so gifted yeah. at the game yeah. that, you know, there's so much that you can take from being around a guy like that. Um, you know, and then getting into Chicago, which was kind of just a group of misfits uh, and, and so on. So that allowed me to, the roles I had to play were where I learned how to play lacrosse. Uh, because before I got to Six Nations, my lacrosse in junior was, you know, just give him the ball and just go do your thing. I went one-on-one. -on -one. The only attribute I had as a lacrosse player. I didn't know how to do anything, but just go one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so I had to learn how to do all these things in those four years. And then luckily when I got to Minnesota, they were in the, in need for a, you know, I, I call them a number one righty. It doesn't mean I was the best player, but it just means my style, your number one is your ball carrier, your distributor and all those things. Mm -hmm. It was the first time I got to go back to doing what I was really gifted at in junior, which was being the ball carrier and creating, but I had, I was able to 
understand the game significantly better at that point because I had done all these other roles up to that point. Mm-hmm. Well, I understood what the guys without the ball were doing and how valuable, you know, their works are or what it's like being that guy that's doing all these picks and slipping inside and being wide open and not getting the ball. I also understood what that was like. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I got to play with uh, one of the, the world's best off ball players in the history of our game, Aaron Wilson. And we just had an immediate uh, chemistry connection, which was great. So he and I, uh, you know, I think we both did really well that season. I think he put up 50 goals and, and whatnot. And, uh, but I also had Ryan Banesh on the other side. And that was, that's, that was a duo that uh, I think went under, uh, underappreciated for so long is, you know, usually your, your duos are on the same side and working together, but I don't know, Ryan and Banesh and I for a long time uh, had a great connection uh, him just being the, you know, the, the number one lefty and me being the number one righty there that uh, we both did really well in our years in Minnesota and it allowed us both to, you know, build some recognition about ourselves to, to be in this league. No, that's great. And you kept getting better too, you know, following Minnesota, you played for the mammoth uh, and had a season with the bandits as well. You scored a career high 115 points in your first season with Colorado. Um, again, talk to me how, you know, even as you got older, you kept, developing your game and adding layers to it? How, how are you able to keep progressing and getting better as uh, your career progressed? I think the reason for that is, is because I never really got taught or learned how to play lacrosse till I became a pro. Mm-hmm. And that just meant the potential ceiling was significantly higher for me than somebody say coming out of Whitby who mm-hmm. had their whole life being coached by actual lacrosse people. You know, I had dads who never really played the game teaching me all the way through junior people mm-hmm. their their ceiling was junior b lacrosse in one of the worst lacrosse markets in ontario at the time uh those were the people and it's not meant to speak poorly of them but you can only provide so much mm-hmm. uh education to people um when that's the ceiling that they were at so uh i think i was able to get better every year because a i recognized how good i wasn't and regardless of how i may have played at times you know a lot of people probably labeled me as like this cocky young kid for a lot of times and that was just you know, I've gone over that. That's just kind of the way I played sports and also a way for me to kind of deflect inner battles of whatnot. But uh, I knew I wasn't great. I knew my limitations and I, I had this aspiration to be better. And, and that mm-hmm. allowed me to continuously get better every every year, every season. And I, uh, I'm i a big film junkie and I like to watch players that I, that I admire. So, you know, I spent, I want to say I spent a solid like two years just watching Dan Dawson and the stuff that he did. Mm. I, I stole certain things that he did really, really well um, and added them to my game and then finding ways to take stuff. You know, I took some stuff from Josh Sanderson, the way that he yeah. was able to make everybody around him so much better, the way that he saw the floor and his, his feeding ability and everything. So what that did was just allow me to finally be exposed because being in Ottawa, I also didn't get to go watch lacrosse players. I wasn't a kid that got to go watch senior lacrosse games and see these best players in the world. Um, my exposure to lacrosse was just what was in Ottawa. So I didn't even get the ability for the creativity, you know, the, your brain to be like, I'm going to go try this or try that. So once I got professional to the professional rankings, I was around this all the time. So I think uh, the ceiling was for growth was so much higher because I was starting at so much less. And that's why I've been able to get better and better. I've also made some really poor life decisions, dedicating myself to lacrosse and getting better, uh, which you know, are not smart moves, but things that not everybody do, right? I put lacrosse ahead of everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and at times that was a really bad move for, you know, obviously money coming in and pushing myself forward in terms of life. But I have this just burning competitive nature to want to be the best everywhere I go. And uh, that's kind of led me to as well, just getting better. And a lot of people talk about it, you know, they're just like, well, you're so much better now. And it's, relatively I was doing the same statistics you know certain things were better since my days in Minnesota up and down mm-hmm. did it reach the ceiling that I was at now no but it's an extra 10 points you know yeah yeah and I'm scoring more goals now lately but you know that's the ball's just going in it's finding its way in I don't know if I'm necessarily shooting that much more or whatnot but uh you know 10 point difference between one season to another that could literally just be 10 guys on my team finishing the ball more times. Right. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think once you're kind of in that thing where, when everybody talks about he's, he's getting better and better and awesome. If my game is actually showing that I'm better, I love that. I'm super appreciative of it. But statistically, when they talk about it, I'm like, I've kind of been there since uh, I was in Minnesota. I've been kind of at that upper echelon point wise. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. mean I, I've ever thought I was upper echelon as good as everybody else, but statistically um, 
like you said, from Minnesota on, I was, you know, I was a 90 point season, 80 point season, 90 point season, relatively in that same thing. So, uh, but for me, it's, it's just a burning desire to win, uh, burning desire to be great and extremely hard on myself to not be sitting back being like, I'm so great. Yeah, no, and you still have that burning desire. I mean, you led the league in points last season. Uh, you were averaging 6.91 points a, uh, per game, which was a career high before, uh, you know, the season was shut down. The Black Wolves were sitting at 7-3, and three too, so you were, had a great team around you. Um, how disappointing was it when you got the news that the season was canceled and eventually that there would not be a champion crown? It was Murphy's year? Law. You know, you just sit back and be – it was the first time in my career that deep into a season was my team sitting – first in the league. Um, I really truly felt we had the the team and to compete with anybody that on the right night, we could win any of those games. And it was the most confident I had been uh, on that hope for, you know, the ultimate goal of that championship. And obviously uh, this kicked in and that shut it down. So it was kind of just one of those, you know, what, what can happen, what happened. And mm-hmm. it did. Uh, but at the same time, I was quickly able to see what was really going around happening to a lot of people in the world. And if the worst thing for me was I lost a, uh, you know, a, a seasonal lacrosse off my, off my list. Um, a, I've been, you know, very, very lucky to play many of these already. And B, mm-hmm. you know, we got to put into perspective. There's a lot of people who've lost their jobs, lost their lives, loved ones. And there's, a, we're hit a lot worse than I was. I just didn't get to continue to play. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, grateful that our, our league took care of us. We, we all still got our salaries and everything. They took care of us in this hard time where they had no revenue coming in and, and whatnot. So uh, instead of, you know, pouting and being sour about it, quickly had to get over it and appreciate what we do have instead of what we don't. No, I think that's a great perspective. And, you know, when the season was eventually canceled, uh, you know, kind of moved on to free agency. You were lauded as the top free agent this offseason. And you shocked a lot of people, including myself, when you signed with the New York Riptide this offseason. What was so appealing about the vision that, you know, Executive P- VP Rich Lisk, who was GM during your time at uh, with the Black Wolves, and uh, GM Jim Veltman, you know, what about their vision really uh, spoke to you when you decided to sign with them? Yeah, I shocked myself with the decision, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> there was zero chance um, before having that conversation that I was actually going to consider going to a place like New York. And the reason for it is I value the opportunity at a championship so high. Mm-hmm. Um, and I loved, absolutely loved everything about the Black Wolves. Uh, I love the team. I love the coaches, the, the management. I love being a part of it. And I wanted to be a part of it. I really did. Um, but uh, once we got talking there was a a different passion that I had when, when speaking to them about being part of growing something, Mm -hmm. Um, being able to, to take a team, you know, don't be wrong. I tell everybody, I'm not the answer from going from one win to a championship Mm -hmm. myself alone is not doing that. Uh, But to be a piece of why that changes um, was very intriguing to me. There was obviously a lot of things that, that we talked about that, um, you know, I hope to, to hopefully have a, a future with this organization uh, now and long term and, and, and whatnot. So there's a ton of potential there, but there's just so many great things in the sense of what we can build, what is going to be built and the vision from the top down. So getting to speak, I, I actually spent some time talking uh, to ownership as well mm-hmm. to hear how committed they were, because that's I've played for organizations where, you know, owners are not committed mm-hmm. uh, and there's a certain there's a certain part of that's lacking in our league and it, there's a justified reason why it's lacking, but of being treated like professional athletes. And I don't mean that in the sense of media or, you know, shiny things, but there's just certain things that, you know, there's an expectation for us as athletes to be professional, you know, mm-hmm. um, when we're on the road and the way we're acting in airports and, and the way we, we, we do things. And I, I'm a hundred percent on board with that. I, I truly believe we as players need to be professional and, and approach these things as if we are, you know, NFL players, NHL players. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's the only way we'll ever be able to stimulate change to create that is, you know, let's live that, that way and act that way. And one day it will be that way, but it's also going to be that on the ownership group. And yep. it's a very difficult thing because we have the argument as players as well. Um, they're not making money off of us. Like, these other leagues are so why would they invest and be passionate and and create you know go above and beyond 
when they're losing money. And I'm empathetic to that like crazy. But at the same time, and players use that same argument. Well, I'm only paid this much money. You know, what if I'm not going to do all these things and act a certain way and invest myself for a whole 20 grand? You know, mm -hmm. if you want me to do these things, pay me better. Well, both sides, I truly believe is, you know, there's a certain way of being uh, running a professional league, a professional franchise. There's a certain way of being a professional athlete. And that's the one thing I think we all can do better. Um, and, and the quicker we handle that part of things, I think we'll see the rest of it follow suit. But step one is we can start with ourselves. And uh, speaking to the ownership group to hear how he wants his program run. He, you know, and it's not that they don't care about money, but he was more focused on the, the experience that his players are getting, the way that things are done, you know, what they're working towards. And to be a part of an organization that that is priority number one of, of being the, you know, the number one franchise that people want to be a part of. And, and that was fun. Um, and, and I'm excited for that to, to be how it is. And I'm excited to, you know, you know, be there and see how, how that becomes. But uh, that was a big push for me to want to sign was, was speaking to Eric, the, the one of the owners there and, and learning. And then obviously, you know, Jim Beltman and, and their vision of the team and their commitment to change. Uh, we've seen a ton of changes and mm -hmm. it, it, it was interesting. They recognized that things needed to change and they're starting to change. Um, so being a part of it was great. And, you know, hopefully it's a organization that uh, I can be a part of for the, the rest of my career and, and post playing career, because uh, I thought that was going to be me for, for new England. And, you know, there's certain things in, in the contract, the way that happened, I'm not going to obviously disclose um, details, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, things happened in, in that, in the negotiation stuff too, as uh, on both sides that could have happened uh, to keep me one place or, or push me somewhere else. So I think, uh, the whole package together uh, and when people, you know, if, we, if I sit down with the player and from the Black Wolves or something over a beer, I'll, I'll obviously break that down to them. But uh, there was a, there's a whole package of things that came into the decision. And, but a lot of it was just wanting to be a part of what uh, the Rift had are doing. Absolutely. And I think it's refreshing too, to hear you talk about, you know, the professionalism of, you know, not only an ownership group, but the players, um, you know, from the top down level, because I think that's kind of what we need for this sport to grow. And I think, you know, the NLL entering its 35th season has seen some growing pains in the past, but they're doing, I think, a, a great job with, you know, treating it as a professional sports league. And I think it's only going to get better as, you know, years progress. I think, you know, Commissioner Sakevich is doing a great job too with the different ownership groups he's bringing in for expansion franchises and stuff. Um, it's just really refreshing and, and exciting to hear. Um, now, I, I want to dive in a little bit to the field side of things too. We talked all about your indoor career. You haven't spent too much uh, time in the field game, but you uh, did initially were, were going to play for the Chrome and the PLL. And then you decided to uh, sign with the Bayhawks this last season. You weren't able to play during their one week season, but talk to me a little bit about uh, your interest in the field game and when we can see you suit up, uh, you know, possibly for the Bayhawks next year. Yeah, no. Uh, so I think a big reason why, again, I, I didn't play uh, in the MLL years and years and years of playing in the NLL is there's a lot of us that, that, you know, we make a good living in, in our summer lacrosse. Uh, mm -hmm, yeah. Some of us do get paid in and we make significantly more there than we would make playing in the MLL. Yep. And we don't have to travel like we do in the MLL. So I think that's what keeps a lot of Canadian players away from playing is mm -hmm. they just happen to have a better financial setup with less demand um, playing Canadian summer ball. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was, I think I had my season in, in Denver and I was playing there and uh, I ran a, a club program called the Ottawa Capitals at the time uh, for years before that. And some of the players would, uh, would ask, why don't you play pro field? Why don't you play in the MLL? Because I'm teaching these kids field lacrosse. And I would always just say, I don't want it. And I started kind of catching myself and I would ask myself afterwards, am I being honest with these kids? Like, is it that I don't want to, or is it that I can't? So I had this now question to myself, could I even hang and play in that league? So that's what was my motivation of really wanting to do it. And it just worked out um, when I was in, in Denver that they were interested. So uh, I was able to play in the MLL a little bit, had some success. I proved to yeah. myself I could definitely play, which was great. Uh, but it was still hard because, again, you're, you're passing up money uh, elsewhere and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. And it's, you know, it's an extra travel now that I had family and all that stuff and, and whatnot. So the stars didn't align there uh, for the PLL. I was actually really excited to be a part of the PLL mm -hmm. uh, their inaugural year. They had approached me. Everything sounded wonderful. I went to their uh, you know, their training camp thing at IMG. It was so incredibly professional. I loved everything that was going on. 
Uh, and, but that was ultimately a tryout and, uh, mm -hmm. going into that, I remember we were, we were in our playoff run with, uh, with new England. Uh, I was in Buffalo getting ready to play them for, I think it might've been the last game of the season before we played them in playoffs. And, uh, it was the second or third time coach Starja called me mm -hmm. and, uh, he, again, maybe he didn't remember calling me doing this, but he basically each time he called me was to remind me he didn't have a clue who I was. I don't blame him, you know, being a field guy, not knowing who I was, but you'd think like you look at your roster. Okay. I'm going to do some research, yeah. but telling me like going into this writing on the wall, like, I don't even think I'm going to get a fair shot at trying to make this team. And I'm not yeah. saying this has anything to do with politics or anything because you could do so many different combinations of players and, and it all works. So I didn't sit back, you know, bitching and moaning or any of that stuff. Uh, but I kind of knew like, what am I going into here? Like this, this coach doesn't even know who I am. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's going out of his way to remind me numerous times, <laughs> uh, which was interesting. So we had the training camp. Uh, he didn't, he ended up putting me on, I, I was in the player pool. He didn't keep me or something like that. I didn't make the team basically, but their way of, and I didn't realize that the PLL did this when I, when I entered the contract and everything, which was interesting. But uh, if you're cut from your team, they hold your rights and they don't let you go play elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that was the hardest thing I had with it. And not, and not once when I was talking to them, did I ever, uh, did I ever complain about not making the team, which was completely fine. You could yeah, yeah. play professional lacrosse long enough to understand you make a team, you don't make a team, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but I was in this player pool when I spoke to, I think it was Josh Sims when he called, you know, he wanted to connect with me because he wanted to tell me how he was shocked that I didn't make a team, which was, mm -hmm. I told him at the same time, I'm like, man, I get it. I haven't played. I filled him in with the calls that I had had. I was like, I kind of say this coming. He's like, I'm sure somebody's going to pick you up, sit in the player pool. Nobody ended up picking me up, which yeah. is, Completely fine, but I was now spending because I was living in Oklahoma. I wasn't playing summer lacrosse anymore. Uh, I was spending this season now not making any money. Yeah. Um, and, and they had me sitting in this player pool, and uh, I ended up reaching out, being like, "Hey, uh, so I know that there's some some MLL teams. There's a Dallas team at the time, and I have some friends who were on some MLL teams that uh, were like, come play for us." Um, I had an opportunity to go make money and this is how I support my family is through playing lacrosse. Yeah. And, uh, I asked them, I'm like, what do I got to do? Can I get this release to go do it? And they would not let me do it. They would, they were holding on. And I, there's gotta be some business stuff. So I, I understand there's things that we all don't know about. Mm -hmm. Um, but I provided no value to the PLL at that time, which is yeah. completely fine. And for me, it was just tough that they actually, and I asked them, I'm like, you know, you, you're, a, you're a league that's about the players and for the players. Well, this is, you know, a player who I'm different than a, a college kid coming out of college or somebody who has a full-time job. You know, I only have a couple of years left of even playing this game, mm -hmm. let alone as a professional in general. I'm getting old. I have a yeah. couple of seasons left. Uh, I, I truly, I ask, can you please just let me go? And so I can A, take advantage of one of my last years being able to play. Um, and B, you know, I need to make some money so I can feed my family. And they just wouldn't, they wouldn't let me, they'll let me out of the contract after the year. And that's what they told me. They're like, we won't make you sit in this player pool for two years mm -hmm. or whatnot. But I, that, that unfortunately did rub me wrong. It's something they were not vocalizing. And I'm, I'm sure there's something in the contract that tells you that and it's our responsibility yeah. to read it and whatnot. But I've, uh, you know, I know tons of guys who've been cut from NLL rosters and they go on and play in another lacrosse league. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's what just, I'm sure everybody assumed and it wasn't something they were shared. Uh, so that was one thing that, uh, you know, obviously sucked. So that is something you want to play, you know, you want an opportunity I wanted to play, but it was also, again, you know, this is, this is how we, I support and I make sure we're taken care of and the bills are paid and, and whatnot. So that, that part sucked, uh, or it sucked a lot. So that was my motivation to be like, I want to go to the MLL and it has nothing to do that. I like one over the other, but mm -hmm. you know, uh, I just would never do that to somebody personally. So that would, you know, again, I think you could look at things, scenarios differently. I was not a guy that they were clearly looking to market or whatnot. And I could see a value of a, you know, some kid that may have, you know, say this just randomly happened to Connor Fields. Well, I see the value of you keeping Connor Fields there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm nowhere near that. I'm not, I'm not selling you tickets. Nobody's going to a field game to watch Callum Crawford. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I felt I could probably help the team at least in some capacity somewhere. And I wanted to go play. So that part sucked. Uh, but with that said, it made me, you know, obviously grateful that somebody in the MLL would want me. There's no guarantees there either. I have to make the team and I have to show I can contribute. And that was the plan to do, uh, this year, but obviously COVID happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't get to be 
uh, go play in the bubble because I run a, a club program out here with uh, Ryan Fournier and uh, I had tournaments that ended up now conflicting with yep. you know, and go and be in a bubble for X amount of time and, and whatnot, the flying in and out, I could have managed, but um, committing to uh, the bubble and being gone for that, in that period of time just was not doable. So yeah, I, I definitely would like to play. Uh, we'll see when this NLL season happens and what the conflict is going to be there between field and box. But uh, no, I definitely have a goal to play. No, that's awesome. And yeah, and I, you know, I appreciate your candidness because, you know, a lot of people, they don't realize too, you know, a lot of things that go behind the scenes, it's not always as simple as, you know, a reason whether you want to play or not. And uh, we certainly are excited to hopefully see you play field again. You know, you brought up to it. We could be in for a little bit of a collision course with depending on when the NLL season starts and the field seasons. But uh, um, I think that is the cool thing about our sport is that, you know, you have two different variations of the sport. Um, in the box game and the field game. And then you have guys like yourself that are able to, to show that they can play two different versions of a sport that, you know, they're very different. The box game and field game, obviously it's still lacrosse, but, um, you know, some people are able to only thrive in one. And I think, you know, you showed what you, you could do when you were on the outlaws and you wanting to, you know, commit yourself to being able to play field game uh, is certainly exciting. We can't wait to see you whenever that is um, take the field. Um, and I want to just talk about before we go into our five and five, you know, you're currently 35 years old, uh, still playing at an elite level. How have you been able to stay in such great shape? What do you do like outside, you know, maybe it's in the gym or nutrition wise to kind of stay in such uh, peak performing shape? So my career path outside of playing and coaching has been a strength and conditioning coach. So I, okay. I've spent so much time in, in learning about preparing athletes and, uh, and whatnot. So I've, you know, I, I dedicate myself to the whole process. You know, there's no real time that I'm not being aware of those things. Um, and it, this all comes down to where I said, again, we need to act like professional athletes ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I think the amount of people in our league that, that live that life now has grown tremendously. But for a long time, um, you know, this was a part-time job for a lot of people. And, mm -hmm. you know, their, their version of training, and it's not everybody, but a lot, at, especially the earlier days of my career, uh, was going to, you know, we call it in Canada, good life fitness. And I'm working on my buys and my tries and my bench press. And there's a significant difference than working out and training, you know, mm -hmm. uh, preparing for a sport and doing all these things and whatnot. I've, I've luckily been in that environment, you know, since I became a pro for the most part, um, I was able to train with, uh, with some of the best sprinters in the world back in Ottawa. Cause one of my best friends was on the four by 100 meter team for the Olympics. Right. And I was able to work with him and his coach and, and all these things. So I got to kind of be around that setting to, to learn how, you know, that type of athlete, professional athletes, you know, train and, and prepare and recover and all those things. So I think that's a big part of it of being able to do it for so long. And then also just commitment. There's a lot of people that have shortened careers and not because they weren't good enough or because mm -hmm. of injury, but because life gets in the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the unique thing where again in our league and that's where people do have the argument to treat it as a part-time job is uh, you know, it is part-time for the most part. And you have a choice to either live your, your, your life as a full-time professional athlete or just, you know, cash in when you can uh, for as long as you can. And for me, I wasn't good enough to, to do it the other way and just rely on just playing and, and whatnot. Um, but there's a lot of guys that, that stop playing because their careers won't allow or their families won't allow and whatnot. And they probably could have continued to play for a really long time and be probably some of the best players we've ever seen. Um, I just never, you know, put myself in a position where life allowed, you know, to provide conflict where I had to make that decision. Mm -hmm. I've been lucky to have, uh, you know, support with my wife and, you know, my kids to allow me to continue to do this. It's not easy on them at all, but uh, the support is key. And, they understand how important this is to me. I've, you know, I've made those life decisions to, to not let anything come in between us. So that's why I think I've been able to go for so long and I'm still, you know, knock on wood, been able to do it at a good level uh, while, while getting older is my body's prepared. Um, mm -hmm. I've spent a lot of time preparing for it. I don't go on vacation for two, three months and then try to restart the engine. Um, I, I, prioritize this over everything else. And that's probably why I'm able to do it. And again, it's not smart. It doesn't mean I'm better than anybody whatsoever. It's just different priorities. And I also know that I'm very ordinary if I don't have something that separates me than, than a group of people. And I think just my approach to how I am a professional lacrosse player has been my separation uh, to allow me to have success. No, that's great. And we're certainly excited to see you suit up again, uh, this time with the Riptide this upcoming season.
Thank you for listening to another episode of the Pro Lacrosse Talk podcast. Today I want to talk to you about our sponsor, Anchor. We've been using Anchor for the Pro Lacrosse Talk podcast since the very start. Anchor gives you everything you need in one place, and better yet, it's free. They allow you to easily record and edit your podcast, and once it's published, they send it out to all the major networks such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and many more. They also connect you with advertisers so you can start making money from your podcast right away. So if you're thinking about starting a podcast today, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Today I also want to talk to you about our affiliate Players Academy. Are you looking to improve your lacrosse game from home? Players Academy, started in part by multiple Hall of Fame lacrosse players including Jay Jalbert, currently offers premier lacrosse online video instructional training courses from two of the top players in the world today, Atlas attackman Rob Pinnell and Archer's midfielder Tom Schreiber. You can learn how to run the two-man game, perform Rob Pinnell's signature question mark dodge, attack from X, work the island, and more in these fun-to-watch lacrosse courses. We've also teamed up with Players Academy to offer a special $25 off your Players Academy course of choice. Simply use the code PLT at checkout and start learning from the best in the game today. Let's go into our five and five segment. Um, so I'll start off with, do you have any pregame superstitions or routines and have they changed over time? The only real one is coffee. So how early I get to the arena and coffee. The <laughs> big reason for it is so A, you know, I just, I want to get there and, and just start being a part of the everything. I appreciate everything there is about being a professional lacrosse player. I truly appreciate it. And I like getting there super early. I also stole that because again, like I said, I tried to learn what certain people do. Uh, something Josh Anderson always did too, is he got there so incredibly early. And I was like, if it's something that the guy's doing, he's one of the greatest of all time, you yeah. know, feel that from him and see if it works for me. Uh, so I get to the arena, you know, minimum three hours early, at least, if not more. And I have to have coffee. Uh, the, I don't do other superstitions. I've probably had some things younger, but my biggest thing is if you have, and I try to tell this to the kids that I coach, if you have superstitions that you're like, I can't play unless this happens. Well, what happens if it doesn't happen for you? Like, what yeah. are you going to do? Uh, you're already set up for failure. Yeah. So get rid of these random superstition things. And it could be something that's that's easy and as, as simple as like, oh, I have to tie my left shoe. But what if that one game you forgot and tied your right shoe? Yeah. And then you, you untie your right shoe and then you go do it the right way. But now you're thinking in your head, well, but I did this and, and you have a bad game. And now you're blaming it on that. And just get, I'm a big one that just get rid of the excuses. Yep. You know, there's no excuse. If you sucked, it's because you sucked. Yeah. Figure out why you sucked and figure and fix it instead of being like, well, I sucked because I didn't tie my left shoe first. And, uh, and, and don't be wrong. Everybody's different. Uh, mm -hmm. I just have a different mental approach that things are very controllable. And sometimes, you know, we just, we don't need a reason why, and we just sucked and that's yep. okay. I think the quicker we can recognize when we just suck, it allows us to get better quicker. No, I think that's a, a good point to that for sure. And then uh, my next question is, what has been your favorite venue to play lacrosse at? You've obviously played at a, a bunch of different ones. Um, what's kind of been the, the best arena or um, it can even be, you know, a, a field as well that you've really enjoyed the environment. Pepsi center is right up there. That arena is Loudhouse, so incredible. Yeah. The fans are obviously amazing. They make, they make the everything, the hot tub leaving uh, ruin that a little bit, you know, <laughs> about the, the, the Pepsi center was pretty darn cool um yeah i'll probably go with pepsi center just because yeah it's it's a newer building it's uh you know they, they they're not lacking anything at that place and the environment's amazing um the excel energy center was pretty amazing too but uh i'll definitely i'll probably go pepsi cool awesome uh, i figured that might be the one the loud house is on a lot of people's list even players that you know are opposing teams uh playing there they, they love that environment um, my next question is what's the story behind the neon green shoes that you've been wearing recently? Um, is that uh, just, again, a, a new style thing or is there any story behind that? Or is that just, you know, a preference that you started wearing those green shoes? Two simple things. So I, I just like shoes. I don't like having what everybody else has. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reason for the flashy colors is so my kids know which one I am when they watch me on the, on the screen. That's awesome. So when I have flashy colors, they know, you know, it, it can, if we all have white shoes on, even though they might be different and mine are super sweet white shoes, they can't tell that from the screen. So when I have something that really stands out, uh, I used to wear bright um, leggings and that allowed them to kind of see me, or I would have certain type of leggings that match the uniform. And they knew it was me. Uh, the league put a rule in that we all have to wear matching leggings now, 
we can't have uh, separate colors. So mm -hmm. uh, me having those shoes allowed, you know, gave them, they knew when I was on the floor the whole time and it made it easier for them. That's awesome. I, I like that uh, a lot. And then what's your current stick set up? Warrior uh, Evo. So Evo, Evo, however we want to pronounce it. Um, <laughs> so they, they're just dropping the new one, but I was using an Evo 5 last year. I'm still using it now. Um, and I was using the burn composite shaft, but they just dropped the new Evo. I think what it's called. Wait, I have a box here with a, I get the name of this new one. And this is not meant as a promotional thing, but <laughs> now you're good. The first metal shaft that I've actually been interested in using since. So it's, what is it? I guess it's just the new Evo or whatever, but um, I've been messing around with it lately and it's, uh, it's a pretty sweet shaft. And then for stringing, uh, I can't string my own stick. I've never been able to. Uh, I'm 35 years old and I can't <laughs> string a stick, which is embarrassing. But my brother always strung my sticks growing up. Now uh, Ryan Fournier has to string them for me. Uh, basically, I just tell everybody, like, I can't tell you what I want. Just make it work. As yeah. long as it works, I'm good to go. Uh, so it's a, a battle for a bit. But once we have it, we're, it's good to go. And I'll use the same head till I can't anymore. Yeah, no, I, I've dabbled a little bit in string my own sticks and kind of learned a, a little bit how, but I, I always preferred when some guy that, you know, on my team was a lot better than I was at it, uh, did it as well. And my final question, lacrosse related is, uh, who is a player or coach that you kind of leaned on as a mentor uh, during your career? I've said this to everybody. Tracy Pulaski was the number one for sure. He's who I had my rookie year. I only had him for... For a year, I actually reached out to him the other day too because I, I stumbled across uh, a DVD of my my first game ever in the NLL and I watched wow. it. So uh, and you know here in my my donkey butt, uh, I think I somebody was doing something and I turned around and punched him in the helmet. He turned around, baseball swung his stick at me, and a scuffle started. And here came Tracy comes running in and just starts fighting the guy. <laughs> uh, and his reason was is because I was a rookie and he was protecting a rookie. Which again, you know, I participated as much as anybody else to start that, but I was honored, and that just shows the type of uh, leader he is. And so I, I took the picture and was just sent it to him, and and then I, you know, just said how grateful I was because again, the only reason I was able to continue was I was so young, so naive, so everything, and he recognized it on day one how little I I knew, and uh, he took his time with me. He was amazing. He was a mentor. He taught me how to do things. He worked with me. Um, one of the greatest lacrosse minds, greatest captains ever, mm -hmm. uh, that that's resonated with me for a long time. And a big reason why I try to help and be the same way for rookies is I've also had the polar opposite with some veterans that, you know, they could give two shits about the young guys. They have to, mm -hmm. they're worried about themselves and it's not wrong. We each all have our own approach to, to being professional athletes, but I understood what the Tracy approach did for me as a young player. Um, I don't ever want to be that veteran that's too snotty to, to work with younger guys, regardless of how good they are. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's one thing is, is that gets caught up in all levels of sport is we'll treat somebody based on how good they are at the sport. Uh, I feel you need to treat, you know, the best rookie who's coming in, the best player, you know, the first overall that, you know, the Jeff Keat, when he finally graduates and mm -hmm. finishes his college el eligibility, you need to treat him the same way that I treat a kid that might be selected on the practice roster. Mm -hmm. You know, I shouldn't be any kinder or more helpful to the first overall draft pick than the, the other guy, because I don't think that should be why we are nice to somebody or why we would care to work with them or have the time of day for them. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had that approach to me uh, and it's scarred me in certain ways where I've had, you know, one of the best players in the history of our game treat me like an absolute piece of crap. Whether he liked me for justified reasons or not, mm -hmm. uh, I had somebody that I idolized in Tracy Koleski, who was so incredibly amazing to me. And then I had somebody else who I idolized for years, who was the polar opposite. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't have the time of day would step on me if he had a chance. And both of those were huge lessons for me. One made me never want to play lacrosse anymore. One made me want to you know, get the hell out of here as quick as I could. And the other one was like, wow, you know, I love this game. I want, you know, I'm so eager to be here every single day. So I recognize what the two ends of the spectrum. And I don't think if I didn't have both ends of the spectrum, I'd be able to look at it as I do now. Mm -hmm. But what I did recognize is when I started having some success in the sport and I had some growing pains, I'm sure uh, learning how to 
be a successful player and, you know, uh, one of the stronger players. Um, I'm sure I had some growing pains in character or whatnot, but uh, I recognize being in that position of what it can do influence and help younger generations. No, I love that. And I love that you're able to kind of give back a little bit too for, you know, um, either the current rookies or young players or, you know, in the future as well. I think that's a great approach. Moving on to the off the field questions. Uh, I know lacrosse takes up a lot of your time, but what are some hobbies or activities you enjoy doing uh, when you're not playing lacrosse? I honestly, there isn't much time that I'm not playing lacrosse or coaching lacrosse. Mm -hmm. uh, the time that I'm not spent doing that, I'm in front of my computer working on, you know, the business side of running lacrosse. Uh, mm -hmm. Outside of that, I'm, I'm spending time with my family. So uh, love, joys and whatnot. I absolutely, the biggest thing I think I've, I've missed through COVID is, is going to the movie, movies. I mm -hmm. love absolute the whole, everything of going to watch a movie in the theater. Um, I haven't been able to do that. I'm kind of out of the loop on, on movies these days and everything. So I think that would be my biggest thing is just, uh, you know, being a movie buff is uh, as lame as my wife will say it is, is <laughs> all I want to do with my free time is, is watch movies. I just truly love it. No, that's great. Well, that kind of segues into my next question. I'm, I'm a big movie buff myself. Um, and we like to ask what's a book that you've been reading recently, but we're kind of thrown in now too, since everyone's quarantined, what's a kind of a movie or a TV show that you've also been watching uh, recently that you'd recommend? I'm caught up. So I haven't watched it in probably at least a month, if not more, but Yellowstone is one that I tell everyone. Okay. I, I've heard that's good. Yeah. With Kevin yeah. Costner, right? Well, I'm a huge cost, you know, the cost, a huge fan. <laughs> I think. Way back to obviously uh, Robin Hood is one of the greatest movies on for me and the greatest versus best uh, that I appreciate. Um, you know, I've watched for some reason when I was growing up, I watched the postman over and over and over. Tin cup is one of my favorite movies forever. So I love Kevin Costner. So when he, when I heard he was doing this, I instantly was sold. Let's watch it. And it is everything so good from the actual show itself, the message behind the show, the education it gives you on a lot of things that are going on in our world with indigenous people and everything. It's a good eye opener. Um, and then uh, the music soundtrack is, is it's on point. Like I sit there with Shazam ready on my phone while I watch the episode because they always have something that comes up that you just need to get it. So uh great 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 show i recommend everybody to watch it there's more like there's tons when we're flying i go through shows like crazy like carnival row if you have amazon uh, okay yeah yeah definitely more up if you have a uh, imagination and whatnot i kind of in those type of things but uh carnival row was really really good okay show. yeah i have amazon so i'll have to check that out and um i definitely i've heard good things about yellowstone we just me and my uh, wife just finished the boys on Amazon, which was a yeah. great show. So we're kind of looking for our, our yeah. next next one. So, so I stumbled in that one a couple of weeks ago and went into it like crazy, but uh, the boys is good. Um, the good thing about Carnival Row, I like it too, is I got a soft side that I love, you know, a good love story that's in there. So it's got a kind of mix of kind of everything in there. So Carnival Row was really good. And then definitely the best show I've seen in a long time is Yellowstone. All right, I'll definitely check both those out. And then going off of that, what's uh, your favorite non-lacrosse uh, athlete to watch right now right now currently playing uh yes or it can be passed it can be passed also yeah. michael jordan wins and obviously we've we've gotten tons of as lebron james's greatness has gotten better and better and better i think it's stimulated more and more and more michael jordan conversation and clips and mm -hmm. probably what stimulated them to make the uh the doc or release the documentary at least anyways um was to just remind everybody how great michael was uh so michael for sure if i had to go off current uh, I was definitely on the uh, the Kawhi Leonard train for a long time, but uh, hmm, Tom Brady, Tom Brady is yeah. definitely going to be the current still playing. Obviously, the greatest in the position. I tell everybody when they ask me who my favorite NFL team is, they say it's the Tom Brady's. So wherever he's <laughs> playing, it's going to be who I'm who I'm rooting for. No, I like that, you know, and uh, he's doing it at a high level, kind of like yourself, uh, a little bit older than you are, you know, about 10 years on you, I think. Um, but it's amazing what he's been able to do, uh, you know, for his career. And uh, Tampa Bay looks pretty good. Tampa's having a good year for uh, sports right now. They have the Lightning uh, just won the Stanley Cup and uh, raising the World Series. And who knows, the Buccaneers are playing pretty well as well. Um, going off of that, what is your favorite place to vacation? Tofino, British Columbia um it's a uh, i think it's the most southern some the 
Vancouver or Victoria guys are going to yell at me. Maybe it's the most Northern, <laughs> but I think it's the most Southern. Uh, it's one of the, the ends of Vancouver Island. And it's, I tell everybody that it, when I try to explain what it is, is picture Hawaii before anybody ever discovered Hawaii. Uh, it's all, there's no McDonald's, there's no Starbucks, there's no Tim Hortons. Everything is locally owned. Uh, there's no big industry there, but it's so incredibly beautiful. It's a small, uh, you know, surf town and whatnot. It is, it is amazing. It has its own uh, rainforest and, and whatnot. It's such a cool place that nobody knows about. When I talk to Americans about where they need to visit in Canada, it's my number one that I tell them. Can't fly. It's awesome. Yeah, no, I've, I've never actually even heard of it. So that's definitely something that uh, maybe me and my wife will check out uh, to potentially visit down the road. Uh, and then my final one is, what is your favorite meal? And do you prefer to take out or cook at home? Um, hmm. Pizza is the easiest answer for that. But uh, smoked brisket is right up there. Ooh, yeah, that's awesome. And you're a takeout guy or do you like cooking brisket at home? At home. So uh, since I moved to the South, I, uh, I invested in a, a Traeger smoker and I've been going at it for two and a half years strong now. No, that's awesome. Well, Calum, this has uh, been great. I like to end on one final question, not part of the five and five, but uh, you were once a young lacrosse player, you know, with aspirations to play professionally. What is some advice that you have for a young player to looking to one day play pro lacrosse? Uh, this is my, I had this talk with some of my kids the other day is, uh, this isn't has anything to do with making them become professionals or anything, but mm -hmm. one, and I, this is advice that I give all players and all parents. Uh, if you're ever really that good, you or your parents do not need to talk about, about yourself or your parents don't need to talk about you or how great you are or whatnot, because everybody else will be talking about you. Mm -hmm. So if everybody else isn't talking about you and everybody else's parents aren't talking about you, so parents as well, you don't need to talk about how great your kid is, right? Um, because everybody else will be doing it. And mm -hmm. I think what that will do will help keep our kids humble and ourselves humble. And the biggest hurdle that we get is when kids are really good for at a young age, they lose the work part and yeah. they plateau so easily. And there are some that are great, super young and, and continue to work and become whatever. But I think being able to uh, understand that we're not good enough, and, and that's just in terms of, of sport until we get to that level. And even when we become professionals, we're still not good enough. Mm -hmm. And that will continue to, to reside with us. So we're always working at getting better and better and better. Because I truly believe the second you don't think you have to get any better is the second you need to retire. Stop playing because mm -hmm. you're, you're as good as you're ever going to be. Um, so those are my two things. It's just socially, you know, if, if we're that good, I don't need to boast about myself. If, you know, parents, if, you're, if your kid is that good, you don't need to go around telling people how great your kid is. I see it as a, as a lacrosse coach and parents want to tell me how great their kids are. And I truly, it's great to be passionate and, and love your kids and all those mm. things. But, uh, telling other people how it just, it, it doesn't get received the way a parent probably thinks it is mm -hmm. um, and players. Because again, sit back and just listen. If you want to know how good your kid is, just listen to everybody else because they'll be talking about them. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's some great advice. And you can kind of see like, too, like what you said, you've always tried to get better and better throughout your career. And you've done that. And um, I love that line that you said, like the moment you think that you're as good as you'll ever be, you know, it's time to retire because you should always be striving for greatness. So um, I love that, Callum. Thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Uh, and, you know, best of luck going forward with the Riptide next season. Thank you. I appreciate having me on. Today I also want to talk to you about our affiliate Streaker Sports. Streaker Sports features an array of throwback t-shirts and apparel, including t-shirts of defunct major indoor lacrosse league teams such as the Baltimore Thunder, New York Saints, Syracuse Smash, and Boston Blazers. They also provide custom uniforms and shorts that are perfect for your rec team's upcoming lacrosse tournament or season. Better yet, we've teamed up with Streaker Sports to provide you with a special discount. Simply visit StreakerSports.com and use the code PLT to save 15% on your order today.